Hi, hi, everyone. This is Kim C., and you're listening to the Year of Underrated Stephen King. This is a one-woman Stephen King book podcast where yours truly, a university fiction teacher, takes her time dissecting the powerful writing within Stephen King's catalog, beginning with the underrated works. Hello, friends, and welcome to part three of our Four Past Midnight coverage. Today we are exploring the slightly over 200-page novella, The Library Policeman. Holy underrated crazy town, Batman. Lots to say on this one, but do pardon the delay on this episode, friends. Computer issues are still afoot, but we're making it happen in the interim, so fingers crossed this goes over well. I've decided it's going to be a bit on the naked side. We're going to try it out. We're coming up from the ashes here a little bit, so maybe it'll be a hit. Don't know. It could be a disaster. Very possible. But I know I've had a lack of backing track for my very emotional slash overly emotional Wizard and Glass Part 2 episode. But today, I'm feeling much more level-headed, so we will see how it all goes down. All right, boys and girls, if you are just joining us on this journey, welcome, welcome. This is my very first read-through of the novella collection for Past Midnight, and I'm really enjoying it thus far, guys. Please jump back to our early episodes on The Langoliers, as well as Secret Window, Secret Garden, to catch up on what we've covered thus far. Due to my aforementioned computer issues, friends, I was able to read The Library Policeman two times. That's a rarity for me. Usually I don't do that in succession, right back to back. I will read it once and then maybe a couple months later it'll pop up again and I'll give it a gander, but because of all the disaster of spilling scalding hot tea on my laptop keyboard, don't do it, I promise, zero out of ten, I was able to read the story twice, and I don't know if that was a good thing, guys. Uh, We're going to get into that much deeper here in a little bit, but I really enjoyed it the first read-through, really polarized a little bit by the very dark subjects within, but with this second reading, I did like it more, but at the same time, I think I could be overthinking it a little bit. I think I might have spent too much time with this story, guys, and this is interesting. This usually doesn't happen, so we're going to see how it all shakes loose because I feel I might be thinking about it too much. It might be a little overwrought. I don't know, because the more I think about it, the more time I've spent with it, the less certain I am about how I feel. The first time, I was like, oh, wow, okay, I'm jiving with this. I like what he's doing. We've got some flirting with the literary a little bit here. I'm here for it. After the second reading, um, (laughs) what do I feel? What's happening? I think I've overthought it. Anyway... If I have any fans out there of 2018's The Outsider, as well as any fans of the New York City Club, that one's a little bit less known. I think it's kind of constant readers only, or if you've recently dabbled in Skeleton Crew and or different seasons, the New York City Club is 249B East 35th Street, and it is an incredibly rich, dark fantasy world. Two Stephen King novellas come out of the New York City Club. We've got The Breathing Method, the last story in different seasons, as well as The Man Who Would Not Shake Hands that is found within Skeleton Crew. I love those both. Super duper mucho. And if you are a fan of The Outsider or those two stories featuring the New York City Club, I really believe the library policeman is going to sit nicely next to those. But oh my goodness, guys, I I love the New York City Club so much. I'm absolutely smitten and I'm so sad we only have two novellas with that setting. I'm grateful for what we have, but oh wow, reading the library policeman absolutely had me salivating for the New York City Club once more. Something about the mysterious setting that King does in both the Manhattan Brownstone as well as this random library in Iowa. I don't know. Amazing, magical stuff. I digress. 
If you haven't yet read The Library Policeman, but you're familiar with the other titles, I do believe this novella will give a lot to you creatively. It is definitely an early blueprint to what King brings to us within The Outsider, as well as the novella If It Bleeds, The New York City Club, I Am a Fan. This one has a lot of robust, fantastical darkness to it, guys. And if you're interested in that, make sure you are reading The Library Policeman. All right, you guys hopefully all know the drill by now, but if not, no worries at all. This investigation of the library policeman is going to contain moderate spoilers, so please make sure you freshly read or listen to the story before progressing further into this episode. I do my best to be vague, but sometimes things slip out during the analysis, so don't come for me, don't kill me, you have been warned. Also, another caveat I really think should be mentioned before we get going, this story is a bit heavy on the human horror element, friends. Watch out for those of you who are survivors and triggered by sexual violence. Yikes, 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 this one is really icky, folks. We have just the lowest of the low sexual violence against a child. So please proceed with caution. This is a darker tale. It's hard, but we have to talk about it. It's a huge part of the story, so we need to go there a little bit. But if you're not in the mood for that, no worries at all. I get it. There are other episodes than these. (laughs) There's other episodes in this one, so feel free to do what you need to do to stay sane and not triggered. But yes, We are going to proceed into a darker territory once more. I'm going to tiptoe around it as best I can, but I'm not really going to have much wiggle room there. So this also might be a warning if you haven't read it yet, but you were thinking about it. Yeah, we got some, some graphic sexual violence in here. Just take care of yourself, folks. So there's that warning. We're going to move onward, and I did want to introduce the Stephen King forward. Each novella in this collection has a lovely little blurb from King. This is a publication from 1990, so we have newly sober King, and we're going to talk about how that echoes in this story a little bit, but I do really like what King is saying with this little forward here. I'm going to read a little excerpt from it now. I am utilizing the American hardcover, and this is on page 404. When I began, the story was titled The Library Police, and I had no clear idea of where I was going with it. I thought it would probably be a funny story, sort of like the suburban nightmares the late Max Shulman used to bolt together. After all, the idea was funny, wasn't it? I mean, the library police, how absurd. What I realized, however, was something I knew already. The fears of childhood have a hideous persistence. Writing is an act of self-hypnosis, and in that state, a kind of total emotional recall often takes place, and terrors which should have been long dead start to walk and talk again. As I worked on this story, that began to happen to me. I knew, going in, that I had loved the library as a kid. Why not? It was the only place a relatively poor kid like me could get all the books he wanted. But as I continued to write, I became reacquainted with a deeper truth. I had also feared it. I feared becoming lost in the dark stacks. I feared being forgotten in a dark corner of the reading room and ending up locked in for the night. I feared the old librarian with the blue hair and the cat's eyeglasses and the almost lipless mouth who would pinch the backs of your hands with her long, pale fingers and hiss, shh, if you forgot where you were and started to talk too loud. And yes, I feared the library police. What happened with the much longer work, a novel called Christine, began to happen here. About 30 pages in, the humor began to go out of the situation, and about 50 pages in, the whole story took a screaming left turn into the dark places I have traveled so often, and which I still know so little about. Eventually, I found the guy I was looking for, and managed to raise my head enough to look into his merciless silver eyes. I have tried to bring back a very sketch of him for you, constant reader, but it may not be very good. 
My hands were trembling quite badly when I made it, you see. <laughs> oh, creepy, creepy. And yes, we have very good right to be afraid on this one, guys. This one is dark. This one is dark. This one is scary. This one hits hard. It's a gut punch. Let's have a quick summary. Insurance salesman Sam Peebles has the dreaded task of giving a speech in front of his Rotary International Club. Because he's clueless on where to begin, he heads to his local Junction City, Iowa library branch to conduct research. There, he meets an elderly librarian, Ardelia Lords, who provides exactly what he needs, with strict instructions to not turn the books in late, for the penalties are swift and severe. After the success of the speech, Sam not only forgets to turn the books back in, but loses them completely and begin to learn about said library penalties. Soon after, Sam is visited by dark visions from the past and terrifying waking nightmares where something not of this world is indeed after him, something that wants a hefty payment for those missing books. Sam, with new and old Junction City friends, must go back in time to learn about the mysterious librarian Miss Lortz and how the library policemen have tortured the town and many others for a long, long time. Dear listeners, because I had such a tricky time with this one, we're going to go a little out of order. We're going to dive right into the characters of this story to kind of grease the wheels a little bit so we can get into the heavier areas, as well as examine the strengths and what's working within the library policeman. And from there, we're going to talk about the not-so-strong areas, the weaker parts, and my criticisms and questions. And that should conclude our coverage on the third novella within Four Past Midnight. So if all of you guys are ready to head in, let's go head first into these dusty library doors and start the show. Hi guys, welcome to the character section of the Library Policeman. As I mentioned previously, usually we start with strengths, but because I'm having a tricky time, Kim C has some analysis paralysis going on with this novella, I thought it best to kind of ease into it. Let's talk about the players of this novella and maybe that'll kind of create more cohesion for me in terms of strengths, weaknesses, questions, criticisms, because I'm all over the place, folks. Pure transparency. You would absolutely have me committed if you saw my notepad. <laughs> I'm just all over the place with this one. There's a lot of perplexing little tendrils within this story, a lot of yarn threads I'm following and spiraling out a little bit. So let's talk about these characters and ease into this story. We're going to start with our main character, definitely a hero in our heroes, villains, honorable mentions conglomerate. Sam is kind of your average Joe. I really believe he's the way King may see himself a little bit. Just kind of a happy-go-lucky guy. He's got a very decent life. I believe he's in his early 40s, which is where King would be right around the time this story was written slash published. He is 
liked by people in his life. There is no mention of children or a wife or having any of those previously come into contact with him in the earlier years. He sells insurance, so we just really have the bare bones of Sam, but King decided to make him our main character. The reason why I believe he did so is later on in the story, about 150 pages in approximately, we find that Sam was the victim of a horrific, terrifying event that we're going to talk about in greater detail in a little bit. But Sam's our main character, and this crazy situation happens to him. He's just an average Joe trying to make it work. He is single at the start of the story. Don't know if that was mentioned, but yeah, single, early 40s, charming, no ailments or anything inhibiting him from connecting with somebody. He's a little bit of a blank canvas, perhaps a bit flat and underdeveloped. More on that in a little bit. But Sam is our main guy. He is who we start to connect to the library and some of the other characters that I'm going to talk about now. So we're going to circle back to Sam. He's incredibly important. But what I do want you guys to take notice of is in comparison to these other characters, Sam is a little on the underbake side. I feel little more could have been given to the reader for Sam. We do learn a lot about his childhood in the latter half of the story when we have this horrific crime happen. But Sam is, for the most part, your average Joe, not a lot of details on him. So we're going to unpack that a little bit more later, but I'm super excited to tell you about the second character. We've got two out of the four, our second character, Dirty Dave Duncan. So Dirty is the nickname that the town gives him because Dave Duncan is... An older gentleman who's been around in Junction City, Iowa, probably his entire life. And wow, what a character, guys. We're actually going to have a little excerpt I'm going to read for you a little bit later on about Dave because he is a star. My goodness. King really gives him a rich and robust backstory. But Dave is most likely in his 70s when we meet him in the story, and he is a recovering alcoholic. Many characters in this story are in a state of recovery, so it makes a lot of sense that King would kind of explore that in his fiction as it was something happening to him in real life. As you constant readers know, 1986-ish is when we get that sort of big crossroads breaking point. There was rumor of an actual intervention with family members where King was basically told to shape up or ship out and since then has pursued sobriety full force. So we are really observing that in this story with these alcoholic characters in a state of recovery and supporting each other. So it's really interesting. But back to Dave Duncan slash Dirty Dave Duncan, was given that nickname by the town because for a good hot minute there, maybe a decade plus, he was a fall-down drunk. What's interesting about Dave is we learn about his story and its beginnings in the 1950s where he's a very handsome guy and a very talented artist. I do love my art inside of King Works. You guys know I am a drooling fan for Duma Key, which has so much art in it. Oh my god, I'm obsessed. Paintings, drawings, sketches, you name it. It's just incredible. Dave Duncan is a painter and paints a lot of murals, billboards, advertisements. He's just dripping with talent. And I do love the description of some of these works. And what happens is he runs into our villain, who we'll talk about here in just a second, who exploits him and really pushes Dave into a very dark path of self-indulgence. He gets into a hole and he cannot get out of it. But when we as the reader meet Dave in the story, he is at the tail end of life. He has a lot of regret. He is somewhat struggling with sobriety as the past starts to bubble up. 
but he is such a huge hero. He has a wonderful character arc at the end. He is so interesting, guys. I love Dave Duncan. He is just somebody who I wanted to spend a buttload of time with, and I'm thrilled that Kane gives him such a rich spotlight because that's what we have. Dave sort of steals the show about 100 pages in. We've got about 15-ish chapters, if I'm correct, and right around chapter 11, Dave steals the show. Dave works at a recycling plant, to my understanding. It's kind of an interesting location. It's on Angel Street, but the street is, of course, misspelled to Angle Street, and Dave, I think it's, yeah, it's just recycling paper, cardboard products, glass. It's kind of in a rough part of town. And so Sam meets Dave there, and Dave is kind of surrounded by some other folks in recovery and struggling to make it. It's kind of on the outskirts of town, unsavory characters, or just these characters who have really gone through a lot, and they're definitely outcasts. They're definitely pariahs from the town, because they couldn't handle their drink, they couldn't handle their substance issues, so they're kind of just cast to the four winds. It's definitely an island of misfit toys where Dave Duncan resides. So I really, really love this character. I do believe he's my favorite out of the entire novella, guys. He's just so strong, really full of great details, growth, and we get some beautiful visuals in terms of the murals and paintings he creates. Some of them are amazing, some of them not so amazing, and used by our villain to propagate more paths of evil. So Dave is extraordinary, and I really, really love him. I kind of wish, we'll talk about this in greater detail in our later sections, I do wish he would have been our main character. More on that in a skosh. So we've got Sam Peebles, who is seeking out Dave Duncan, because Dave is the only one who has single-handedly experienced the villain at the heart of this story. He is the only one who has survived said villain and has lived to tell the tale. And unfortunately, his life was put in such a hurricane after this villain. He's really been struggling ever since. Our villain definitely ruined Dave's life. So Dave is a character full of remorse and regret and reflection. And it really makes for some beautiful literary moments. Our next character is not as vibrant as Dave, but she is sort of essential, I would say, and that's Naomi Higgins. Naomi Higgins is also known as Sarah Higgins because she too is an alcoholic, and she's kind of become, from what I infer from the text, Naomi's a little bit of a dead mother for the local branch of Alcoholics Anonymous. They all know her as Sarah. She's very tender and loving, very maternal to everyone because she herself has been struggling with sobriety, but has been clean for almost 10 years, I believe, according to the text. Sam knows her because they work together. Sam, I believe, asked her out on a date in the past, but he ordered alcohol and that really, really scared off Naomi. But she is a strong lady. She is someone who does not wear her emotions on her sleeve. Very matter of fact, pragmatic, practical. She is not interested in Sam at all. It's purely business. And when this problem arises with this villain... She's definitely protective of Dave, but she wants to help Sam, so she's trying to build bridges between her connections, between the people she knows, while keeping the vulnerable recovering alcoholics in her life as safe as possible, as well as protecting herself. So she's really, really interesting, Naomi slash Sarah. Sam knows her as Naomi, and then the recovering alcoholics all call her Sarah. So it's just kind of something you got to juggle throughout the narrative, but it works. I do like Naomi's character. I wish there was a little bit more of it, but I think King really gives the spotlight to this other female, and that is our villain, in all caps, a fascinating female creature villain. We have Ardelia. Lords. Ooh! We have an AL initials present, which makes me really excited because when I see AL, ladies and gentlemen, 
I think of Andre Linoge, one of the coolest Stephen King villains in my favorite, favorite, favorite Stephen King miniseries, Storm of the Century. That was a 1999 three-night epic that appeared on the ABC network. I love it so much. I have a really huge episode where I nerd out for almost three hours, so check that out if you haven't. Andre Linoge, man, one of my favorite bad guys. Definitely related to our old pal Randall Flagg. Can't confirm or deny, but it's just a hypothesis I have. Lots of similarities they share. Oh my goodness, yes. So, Andre Linoge, Ardelia Lortz, is that something? Don't know. I want it to be something, that's for sure. But wow, guys. Okay, so Ardelia Lortz is in our big spotlight. King definitely lets this villain steal the show, and she does. Wow. Okay, Sam meets her, and this story is taking place present day with a huge flashback to the 1950s, but Sam meets her present day, which is probably late 80s, and she's a senior citizen. She is your quintessential cliche representation of a librarian. Gray-haired, glasses, knowledgeable, maybe slightly unapproachable. That's Ardelia. But what's interesting about the Sam Ardelia meetup is that he gets a glimpse of the library as nobody has ever seen it. There are terrifying posters up on the walls. I'm going to discuss this in greater detail in our next section, but Sam is very put off by what he observes. He's uncomfortable. He really doesn't like it. And so he hightails it out of here with his books, which he eventually loses. And then suddenly Ardelia starts to take nightmarish forms in his imagination and what we find out in Sam's detective work trying to understand what was that woman? Why am I dreaming of her? Why am I so afraid of what's transpired between the library and now? We find out Ardelia was once a young, beautiful woman, as all villains can appear to be, the whole Satan in a sundress, and that is Miss Ardelia. And we get this beautiful flashback with Dave Duncan when She came into town and he absolutely fell head over heels in lust with her. Oh my gosh, lust in all caps, guys. I've never really seen a kind of sexual frenzy that King describes as huge as what goes down between Ardelia and Dave. Wow, guys, like, it's it's interesting. (laughs) It's the 1950s and she is not the traditional definition of a succubus, which is a demon that post-coitus will eat you and rip you to shreds. You got incubus, the male half of that, succubus being the female. Ardelia is a kind of succubus in that post-copulation, she kind of takes something and transforms slash mutates Dave into a shadow of himself. She really pushes him down the path of extreme alcohol abuse, guys. Also, he will be more malleable to do her bidding. And he becomes her little minion. And in between all that, they are just rampantly screwing, guys. Like, they are consistently having sex. He can't even see straight or breathe or know his name. She's just like this frenzied sex demon. (laughs) Each time they bang it out, he's less and less of himself and more and more of her servant, her minion. Really fascinating, guys. And there's no love between them. Dave makes that very clear. They are just screwing like animals. They are really shagging like two dogs over and over and over again. And it's like, whoa, okay. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's an interesting dynamic that they have. And the sexual element really gives greater depth to what this thing is. Because Miss Ardelia is definitely a thing, guys. There's a reason I mentioned The Outsider for all y'all at the beginning. 2018's The Outsider definitely plays with the mysterious paranormal creature concept slash a feeder. Without revealing too much on The Outsider, let's just say there's an entity present in the novel that feeds 
on, I won't reveal that, feeds on something. That is a character element that King explores often with his villains. For example, Pennywise the Clown fed on children's fear. I do believe there are many other feeders in King's work, but here, Ardelia is showing herself to be another feeder in the camp that Pennywise takes, which is fear. Children's fear, specifically. Young children's fear, like pre-K to five years old. Because as a librarian who works in the children's section, she gathers them all to her, and it's the 1950s, you know, parenting wasn't exactly stellar. There wasn't a lot of nurturing going on. I mean, yay for you if you were a boomer who was nurtured, but the majority of them weren't because their parents weren't nurtured. They were depression babies. Forget it. That's a whole nother tangent for another day. But Ardelia, as the town librarian, this sexy, sly Satan in a sundress, she appears like this bright-eyed Disney princess beckoning all these children to her, only what happens is she terrifies them. She starts to really frighten them and is able, in turn, to feed off of that. And we actually have a very concrete scene where King describes exactly how she does that. And it's it's really fascinating and allows me to think of other feeder villains in the Stephen King universe, and even those I don't yet know about, because I haven't read those titles yet. But very cool. And I do love this female king villain. I love the actual physical transformation she undergoes. I'm not going to reveal too much of that, but there is some morphing going on. There is some mutation, some really frightening stuff that Dave witnesses when she is feeding. And then we also have her aging still connected to a female human form, and then what she looked like, young and beautiful, but yet still concealing a sort of creature within. He's playing with some really cool stuff here, guys. Ardelia Lords is a villain I would love for all of you to spend some time with, especially if you are someone who loves king villains, especially the female ones. We've been reading about some good ones thus far on the podcast. Of course, you've got your iconic Annie Wilkes. I just recently got to know Rhea of the Coos from the Dark Tower universe, specifically Wizard and Glass. But we have some Stephen King villains up in here, and Miss Ardelia Lords definitely has my attention. I know this is just a 200-page novella, but what King is doing with this creature, she is most definitely a creature, is fascinating, guys. There's a little bit of the Pennywise playbook present, which is always good to see for us It fans out there. We also have that continued exploration of childhood trauma and how there are monsters out there who are dead set on children. And it's just terrifying. When we look at 2014, I believe, Dr. Sleep, we've got Rose the Hat, another feeder hungry for the essence of psychic children. These children aren't necessarily psychic, but they are young and vulnerable and afraid. And that fear is exactly what Ardelia Lords needs. So let's spend some time with her, guys. She's cool. She's really cool. Anytime she was featured on the page, I was absolutely gobbling it up, sort of picking apart as much as I could on the various iterations of her we have. We've got our beautiful 1950s femme fatale absolutely using her femininity and her sexual appetite to destroy a man and make him her slave. We have the elderly version of her that's very unassuming yet still terrifying. And in various chapters of the book, King makes her monstrous with monster-like elements. And then we have a memory from Dave where we actually see her in this mutated creature form, guys. Fascinating stuff. I really like Ardelia Lortz. Very cool. Is she related to Andre Linoche? I hope so. But I definitely think, especially where this story takes us, she could be a Pennywise cousin. So for you It fans out there, if you haven't read The Library Policeman, let's do that. By all means, watch out, watch out, because 
as we were going to talk about in our next section, we got some dark stuff coming up specifically in regards to children. But to recap our characters of the library policeman, we have main character Sam Peebles, happy-go-lucky insurance salesman who really stumbles upon this disaster just trying to make a speech. Next, we have my favorite character of the story, Dirty Dave Duncan, also known as Dave Duncan, the sad, unfortunate soul who was a victim of Ardelia Lortz. His entire life was ruined thereafter, but he still has a sweet soul and wants to do good. Next, we have the Alcoholics Anonymous den mother, Naomi slash Sarah Higgins. She is strong, determined, pragmatic, matter of fact, has zero interest in Sam Peebles, I kind of want to know who she would be interested in because she seems like such a caretaker. Seems like she would really only draw close to you if you were in dire need of help. She is giving off a lot of maternal energy and not necessarily the femme fatale energy of our villain, holy hell, Miss Ardelia Lortz. This succubus librarian creature that represents herself as a sexy, sexy 1950s pinup gal that Dave is just obsessed with. And then she is also a monstrous fear-eating creature and slightly slash very frightening elderly librarian utilizing the setting of the library to propagate her evil intent. More on that later. Those are our four characters, guys. I do feel a little bit better going into our next section where we're going to explore the strengths within the library policeman. But once more, Sam Peebles, Dave Duncan, Naomi slash Sarah Higgins, and the villain to keep your eyes on, Ardelia Lortz. I think we all have some books to check out. Let's head to the front desk and I'll see you in the next section. lovies. This is the strengths section or what's working within the library policeman. And I've just, for whatever reason, folks, had the hardest time with this one. I don't really know why other than I'm overthinking it. I might have spent too much time with this story. Or the other thing is that my criticism section may outweigh the strengths, which is kind of new. Usually, the strengths of a king piece far outweigh the criticisms, but we might not have that in today's examination, guys. But before I put the cart before the horse, let's focus on what I really, really like. Let me try to make sense of my crazy person notepad. Oh my gosh, just scribblings everywhere. But I do think I nailed it down to at least three. (laughs) This was a tricky one, guys. We just have so many amazing things in the story and so many not so amazing slash questionable things in the story that Kim C was truly stuck. I was truly stuck But let's do this one element at a time. Let's kick off our first one with dark fantasy setting. Yes, folks, King absolutely creates a genre piece with this story. I know he may not have intended it as we gained from the author forward. King just kind of goes, right? He has no idea where it's going when he begins the journey and it just kind of turns into something. But what I love, love, love about this novella is how this very unassuming little library in Junction City, Iowa is absolutely soaked in dark fantasy. I don't think we have enough details to call it a gothic setting, even though King uses the gothic all the time. It's really brilliant but we have all the makings of some beautiful, dark fantasy. Sam Peebles steps inside this library. It is dark, dusty, seemingly abandoned, 
and there's one elderly lady in the children's section. And this gives me so many vibes of the Manhattan Club, as I mentioned earlier, because something about this library, just like there's something about the club that isn't so normal, something about this library is very strange. What the reader learns is that most of it is centered around Ardelia Lortz and these very terrifying posters on the wall. They're so beautifully described, guys. There's like a very unsettling little red riding hood with a terrifying wolf. There's some really graphic and macabre posters. My art fans out there, if you are into paintings within the Stephen King world, The Road Virus Heads North is another beautiful short story found within Everything's Eventual, haunted paintings, haunted art. If that is your vibe, make sure a library policeman is one that you spend some time with because this library is scary. (laughs) Guys, these posters are frightening. And the one that really frightens Sam Peebles the most is this trench-coated, silhouetted figure named the library policeman. It's got a scar on his face and all of this sort of bubbles up to the surface of Sam's mind later on in the text, but this very menacing figure called the library policeman is looking at Sam and really frightening him. These posters are created to make one afraid, specifically children. There's even one of, oh my god, it's like a little baby roasting over a spit. It's it's rough, guys. These posters are dark. They are vivid in detail. They are cool. <laughs> so I love me some art in King's work. I love that he took some time to really explore. And they're huge, guys. These are not tiny 8x10s. These are huge 24 by 36 inch, if not larger, like movie poster size, which I believe are, God, they can be 27 by 40, like something nuts. Inches, of course, not centimeters. Enormous posters that grab your eyes, make you incredibly uncomfortable and unsettled. And this is the library very, very, very much soaked in dark fantasy because there's something about this place he can't put a finger on. And of course, the dark fantasy really, really solidifies a few days later when Sam returns to the library and it's completely different. There are no posters on the walls. There is no one named Ardelia Lords who works there. No one's even heard of her. The setting is bright and sunny and inviting and open. And where was this terrifying, shadowed, cold, abandoned seemingly place that he was at just a few days before? So fantastic. I love it. Really gets the imagination going and really allows King to stretch some muscles in a skill that I feel he's so strong at, which is creating these dark, fantastical settings. Because like the Manhattan Club, there is something darkly magical about it. It's not a gothic setting. For example, my super duper love obsession of Duma Key, the homes on Duma Key weren't necessarily haunted in their own right. It was more or less Duma Key. The actual beach was what makes it gothic. We have, of course, the Overlook, infamous for its haunting. The Overlook didn't really do anything. It just happened to have a whole bunch of crazy people get murdered or killed in said hotel, and those ghosts just kind of hung around. Incredibly gothic. Ghosties, mystery. This is a little different. This is a little different. You could argue it's gothic, but it's so ephemeral. We don't really get a lot of time spent in the library. We have it at the beginning and at the end, but it's really connected to Ardelia. So she's kind of the conduit to this dark little cave that is the library. But I love it, guys. King is playing with some dark fantasy here that is fascinating. Love it so much. When we learn that Ardelia is not a normal female, that she is indeed a creature of some sort, this enhances the dark fantasy, most definitely. So once more, for my New York City club fans, as well as The Outsider, check this one out. 
Okay, everybody, my second element of strength found within the library policeman is, of course, human horror. We've been kind of discussing a little bit that we've got a lot of paranormal, fantastical stuff happening. We have an actual monster, we have a terrifying, mysteriously magical setting that is connected to this paranormal thing. We got a lot of that going on. But we also have some truly terrifying human horror in here, guys, that is an immense strength. Now, for those of you who have listened to the podcast for a hot minute or a short minute, I have a problem with this personally just because human horror hits a little deeper for me than ghosties, any of the king bad guys that aren't grounded in reality. I am usually more terrified of the real as can be ones, such as your Norman Daniels, your Annie Wilkes, as well as the heinous and horrific ending to Bag of Bones, where there is physical violence, sexual violence. That is what terrifies me to my soul. So here we do have a harrowing scene of sexual violence against a child. Without revealing too much, it is nine-year-old Sam Peebles on his way to the library, and there is a man who says, I'm a policeman, follow me, and guess what happens, guys? If you're guessing that nine-year-old Sam is sodomized in the bushes, you would be right. It's a very difficult scene to, to read. However, and here's why I love slash hate King so much. It's so well written, guys. It's just so damn good. I mean, who wants to say that about a rape scene? I mean, I, I, the fact that that just came out of my mouth makes me ill, but that's, that's King. He does, first of all, in general, sexual violence or really crime of any kind. I mean, ask your local thriller author if they have an easier time, but it's difficult to write, guys. In my fiction classes, all of the revised editions, everybody loves the gory details, but oftentimes those are the source of great problems in the text or where writers usually have to spend a lot of time getting it right. So here, with this harrowing rape scene. God, it's so bad, guys. It's really bad. But what's so amazing about it is King, of course, gives the point of view to young Sam, which is heartbreakingly awful. However, it pulls the reader so close to this terror. And this sweet little boy, he doesn't know what's happening to him. His imagination, his small frame of the world, his small worldview is doing its best to try and articulate and describe what is happening to him. It's awful. We as readers, hopefully adult readers, know exactly what's happening to this little person physically, and it's heartbreaking. But when you are forced to be in the mind of this little victim, it's very, very difficult, but it's also amazing how he did this. It's just... I'm so conflicted, guys. I think that's another reason why the library policeman has me so scrambled, is I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about this. You guys know, if you listen to my Bag of Bones episode, I I am a hot mess. I'm just a hot dumpster fire of emotion because the ending of that book is so horrific for me. For me personally, I just can't handle it. It's just the worst thing I've ever read from King. This is up there, guys. This is really, really bad. However, I never stopped reading it and I actually went back and read the scene again. Like, what's wrong with me, number one? The only way I could answer that is I'm so in awe with how he wrote this scene, how he writes these scenes of absolute pure terror, pure human evil, human horror, these crimes that are so visceral and uncomfortable. And yet, I guess the only way that makes me feel better about it is just seeing how he put the bricks in place. What word choice, the decisions the execution. That's what helps me stay sane in the midst of the terror. So what I will say, guys, is this harrowing, terrible, horrific scene is really well done. And (laughs) yeah, that's really all I could say because I don't want to say go read it. I don't want to say that. Don't. Uh, But if you are someone who appreciates King's writing, really, really appreciates the writing craft really likes to examine fiction with a microscope. Be in the moment. 
with these creative decisions, you have an immense opportunity here, ladies and gentlemen. This is a class all on its own. How do you write about these moments in such a skillful way without going too far, even though it does go too far, but like, how do you not lose the reader completely? How do you dangle them just far enough over the cliff edge that they will follow you over said cliff edge? Fascinating, guys. And perhaps my time spent with King is giving me a little bit more resilience, a little bit more crust and callus to where I feel I'm stronger. But really, it doesn't get easier reading about sexual violence in his fiction. It never gets easy. It shouldn't. It shouldn't get easy. But what helps me cope is examining how word for word he did this. And it's fascinating. The point of view that we have, the terrifying descriptions, the terrified child coming through, it's amazing how it was done. I really do believe this scene was done well. That's what makes it digestible and tolerable. Even though it puts a bad taste in my mouth, I'm very uncomfortable when I approach the text in my analysis. I feel really, really icky. I feel very, very sad. You know, I don't come away unscathed. But what helps me is examining how he's doing it, how he is approaching it, and the importance of it. The reason why we need to lean in even though we're terrified, even though we don't want to. So I think this is why the library policeman really has me scrambled, guys. There's such strength in this horrifying rape scene. There really is. But at the same time, it's horrifying. It's a young nine-year-old child. It's awful. And I can't imagine what King must have felt writing this, guys. Like, yikes. Whoa. And we're going to talk about it in our next section, if it was really even worth it. I, I don't know. I'm too scrambled. But When I think about this story, I see it as a strength. So there is that. I see the character of Sam Peebles as a really flat, sort of underbaked character that needed a lot of ingredients to make him work, to make the bread rise, so to speak. And then we have this scene and you're like, okay, he just dropped bomb for this character. And the reader is kind of left with piecing it all together. And that maybe the character of Sam has been running from this truth his entire life, and seemingly that's why he is so happy-go-lucky, because he locked this thing away so deep and darkly down that he completely forgot about it. Which kind of leads me to my last and final topic. One of the big themes I find inside the library policeman is, of course, the tortured past. In this story, we have several characters who are not necessarily running from their past, but who have been shaped by it to where they are tortured. The past is definitely haunting them in that they can't move on. So I think that King is exploring a lot of what addicts face in terms of confronting addiction with a lot of remorse and regret. This is why it's one of the 12 steps about making amends, and pardon me, I don't have them all memorized, but when someone is finally sober and looking at really all the damage they caused, some people move on from that, and some people stew in the pain they've caused and let it define the present day. And so we've got a lot of characters haunted by the past. That's really the echoing theme here. Dave really became a shadow of himself because of what Ardelia did to him. He could never really get free. And when he's kind of forced to explain what happened and what he was a part of, he's just absolutely broken up about it. And it really takes, I would say, everything. Everything he's got for sure. We also have the character of Sam, who seemingly, this is just my readerly opinion, buries this shame and this guilt so deep down that it really didn't affect his present day. We've got Naomi, another one who kind of looks at it, at her alcoholic past as something that gives her purpose, so hers isn't quite so damning as the others. But the past 
and its torturous clutches is a very huge theme within this story, and I like it. When I look at these characters and you spend some time with this story as it gets crazier, as they realize this Ardelia Lord's is in fact someone, something that must be stopped. It's very similar to the strengths we have in It. I know we've got a lot of It fans out there because, yeah, it's amazing. King has the Losers Club go 27 years into the future when they're about 10 to 11 years old. They really haven't been able to move on. They moved on a little bit, but when Mike Hanlon calls them all up to return to Derry, it is like wrangling some buck and broncos. They don't want to come back, even though they know that their lives were completely altered because of what happened in the past. The past is always around. And if we're not careful, if we don't work at it, if we're not consistently coming to terms with what happened, it's going to destroy us. And King is really exploring its ability to destroy if you don't take care of it. If you're not seeking support, if you're not reaching out, building community, confronting it, don't keep it buried. Really sophisticated stuff going on here with this, guys. So I like these strengths. I know there are more, but the more that I come up with, the more they're tied to my criticisms. So this one's a tricky one, guys. Talk about reeling in a big fish. This is a heavy fish on the line and it does not. It's just so unclear and opaque. This one's such a challenge. I keep saying that over and over again because I can't believe how difficult this is for me, guys. I don't really understand why. I need all of you guys to read The Library Policeman and we need to talk about it. We need to be friends. We need to talk about it because I'm just... I'm stuck. Maybe it's because my computer broke and there's just like something that broke in me (laughs) with my computer. I don't know, but this one is so unique and interesting. So to recap, we have the dark fantasy setting of our Junction City, Iowa library. Lots of cool stuff going on. And those posters, yes, give me those posters all day. No matter how scary they are, I absolutely love the haunting artwork and its ability to absolutely terrify such good stuff. Oh my goodness. Next, we have the human horror, specifically this very uncomfortable, unsettling, deplorable rape scene. It's done with such strength and such finesse that I can't help but examine it as a strength. The dark theme within this story, the sexual violence and crime, it's really working well. It really kind of makes the story, guys. When you get to this point in the novella, you really start nodding your head and you're like, I get it. Yup, I get it. Did it go a bit too far? We'll examine that in the next section. But for right now, I am calling it a strength, especially when you actually examine the scene, which I hate that I have to do, but it does make me feel better when I take a look of how he did it word by word. Definitely a strength. And then lastly, we have the past. We have the past and its ability to torture, maim, control, destroy if we don't confront it. This is a huge theme, of course, in It, and it is present once more again in the library policeman. As I mentioned previously, Ardelia Lortz might be a Pennywise cousin, so she is alive and well about 30-ish years in the future, as we first see her in the 1950s. It's the mid to late 80s, so she's aged a little bit, but she has not been knocked down. So we do have some echoes of it coming through about the past coming back to get you if you don't confront it, destroy it, and take care of yourself. Super good stuff, everyone. All right, before we head on out of here, I did want to read a little excerpt from the text because we have such beautiful writing with the character of Dave Duncan. As I mentioned already, he's my favorite, guys. Hands down, Dave Duncan's my favorite character in The Library Policeman. Such strength, so much good stuff. So I wanted to read a tiny slice of Dave's story, which I believe is around end of chapter 10, chapter 11. Once more, I am reading out of the American hardcover. This is beginning on page 506. She's after you, isn't she? Dave asked. That bitch from the far side of hell. She sick someone on me, Sam said. Someone who was in one of those posters you drew. He's a... I know this sounds crazy, but he's a library policeman. He came to see me this morning. He'd 
did, Sam touched his hair. He did this and this. He pointed to the small red dot in the center of his throat, and he says he isn't alone. Dave was silent for a long time, looking out into the emptiness, looking at the flat horizon which was broken only by tall silos, and to the north, the apocalyptic shape of the Proverbia Feed Company's grain elevator. The man you saw isn't real, he said at last. None of them are real. Only her. Only the devil bitch. Can you tell us, Dave? Naomi asked gently. If you can't, say so, but if it will make it better for you easier. Tell us. Dear Sarah, Dave said. He took her hand and smiled. I love you. Have I ever told you so? She shook her head, smiling back. Tears glinted in her eyes like tiny specks of mica. No, but I'm glad, Dave. I have to tell, he said. It isn't a question of better or easier. It can't be allowed to go on. Do you know what I remember about my first AA meeting, Sarah? She shook her head. How they said it was a program of honesty. How they said you had to tell everything, not just to God, but to God and another person. And I thought, if that's what it takes to live a sober life, I've had it. They'll throw me in a plot up on Wavern Hill, in that part of the boneyard they set aside for the drunks and all-time losers who never had a pot to piss in nor a window to throw it out of, because I could never tell all the things I've seen, all the things I've done. We all think that at first, she said gently. I know, but there can't be many that have seen the things I have, or done what I have. I did the best I could, though. Little by little, I did the best I could. I set my house in order, but those things I saw and did back then, those I never told, not to any person, not to no man's God. I found a room in the basement of my heart, and I put those things in that room, and then I locked the door. He looked at Sam, and Sam saw tears rolling slowly and tiredly down the deep wrinkles in Dave's blasted cheeks. Yes, I did. And when the door was locked, I nailed boards across it. And when the boards was nailed, I put sheet steel across the boards and riveted it tight. And when the riveting was done, I drawed a bureau up against the whole works. And before I called it good and walked away, I piled bricks on top of the bureau. And all these years since, I've spent telling myself... I forgot all about Ardelia and her strange ways, about the things she wanted me to do, and the things she told me, and the promises she made, and what she really was. I took a lot of forgetting medicine, but it never did the job, and when I got into AA, that was the one thing that always drove me back. The thing in that room, you know? The thing has a name, Mr. Peebles. Its name is Ardelia Lortz. After I was sobered up a while, I would start having bad dreams. Mostly, I dreamed of the posters I did for her, the ones that scared the children so bad, but they weren't the worst dreams. His voice had fallen to a trembling whisper. They weren't the worst by a long chalk. Maybe you better rest a little, Sam said. He had discovered that no matter how much might depend on what Dave had to say, a part of him didn't want to hear it. A part of him was afraid to hear it. Never mind resting, he said. Doctor says I'm diabetic, my pancreas is a mess, and my liver is falling apart. Pretty soon I'm going on a permanent vacation. I don't know if it'll be heaven or hell for me, but I'm pretty sure the bars and package stores are closed in both places, and thank God for that. But the time for resting isn't now. If I'm ever going to talk, it has to be now. He looked carefully at Sam. You know you're in trouble, don't you? Sam nodded. Ugh, stupendous. Love it. Guys, every scene that Dave's in is just as rich, just like that. Oh, wow. It's so good. So good. Dave Duncan's amazing. King gives him these beautiful monologues. Pretty much all of chapter 11 is Dave recalling his sexual escapades with Ardelia and how mystical and magical and frightening she was and how he just started drinking and spiraling. It's great. Oh my god, it's so great. Please spend some time with Dave. He is magical. He is wonderful. So really, every time that the spotlight is on Dave, I gobbled it up. King did a brilliant job with that character. Lots of great stuff there. So yeah, I think that scene definitely highlights the dark past coming for us, coming for our characters within the library policemen. So much good stuff, guys. A lot of strength, a lot of depth, a lot of 
dark depths. We're going to head into our next section, exploring my questions and criticisms, of which there are a few too many, definitely more than I'd like. So everybody grab your books and don't you dare lose these books as we head out. Take care and I'll see you in the next section. Alright boys and girls, come closer to the reading circle. This is our last section exploring my questions and criticisms within the library policemen. We have quite a few guys. I did cross out a couple, narrow them down, but let's just say I did have some problems with the text toward the end. I think if we're looking at this novella in three acts, the first two are very, very strong. And then the third act is fine, but maybe I'm just hungry for a little bit more depth or just wanting a little bit more than what was provided. Let's just say if you've read The End of the Outsider, we kind of have a similar ending here. It's really interesting. I feel those texts are absolutely mirroring each other in such a strong way, which is fascinating. So Later King 2018, I believe, was The Outsider's release date definitely has little threads, little threads to these past tales. And if we're paying attention, we can definitely draw some parallels. So my first criticism is the fact that I believe Sam Peebles is a flat character, ladies and gentlemen, and we don't really get a lot of those in King Works, or when we do, there's typically a huge cast roster. There are so many characters that King really can't give attention to everyone all the time at every moment. They all can't have a huge backstory. I mean, look at the Losers Club. We've got a lot of folks in there, but everybody gets proper time, proper spotlight. That's why we love them all so much, because we just have so much development. So Sam is our main character, and as I kind of mentioned in our first section, guys, he's really just an average Joe. There's nothing to this guy. We don't learn about his parents. We don't really learn... I think we learn a little bit about his mom. There's just... Not a lot of detail. We don't know if he's ever been married before. We don't know about his relationships with women. We don't know if he wants to have children, what his hobbies are. We just, there's nothing, there's just nothing there. But what we do get a huge glimpse of is that he was the victim of this terrible event as a child, okay? And so here's the thing, guys. I think King has a beautiful way of describing literary fiction versus genre fiction. It's a little rudimentary, but it actually works. So King says the difference between the two. Genre fiction is, of course, ordinary characters encountering the extraordinary. And then the other side of that, literary fiction is extraordinary characters encountering the ordinary. It it works so well. It actually really does. And so I feel that King really didn't know how to chew up as much as he bit off with what happened to Sam because he leaves him very underbaked and he puts Sam in a lot of these moments where the foreshadowing is huge, right? Throughout this entire novella, Sam is struggling to connect with this library policeman that is so frightening. He comes into his dreams. He has a lisp. He has this horrible odor to him. There's just some really haunting visceral qualities about this man that is appearing in his dreams, in his waking life for that matter too. So then in the third act of the book, we find out that Sam was raped by some random man. He was never caught. And this man said, follow me, I'm a policeman. And this nine-year-old Sam, oh my God, it's horrible, right? That is the true terrifying heart of this story. We hear about Ardelia committing horrible crimes against children in terms of frightening them, feeding off that fear, but now we actually have a crime against a child, and it's a human one. There's no paranormal entity needed. This is just the ugly world as it is. And so Sam, what I have a problem with, guys, is I feel King brings us this rape scene so late in the story, which it's fine, it's fine that it's late in the story, but I guess my question is, 
Did he really not want to go literary fiction with it and let the rape greatly impact Sam's life forever and tell the reader about that? Like, was that too much? Too much that would be required? And he just avoided it altogether? Because I think that's what happens. At the end of this story, Sam kind of confronts the library policeman, in a way. Uh, When he confronts Ardelia, she, of course, manifests this terror, this thing that he's been scared of and running away from his entire life. He just seems so unscathed by it, guys, and it just isn't working for me. I feel that, I mean, granted, everyone deals with trauma differently, right? There is no one quintessential response to trauma. It's different for everybody. But I just wish there would have been some sort of consequence or some sort of reverberation of the trauma because Sam seems so well adjusted. Nothing stops this guy. Like, he's just so normal. He's so normal. There's nothing you would never ever guess that this trauma happened to him. That itself could be very factual and absolutely normal. But maybe I'm just used to sort of the literary fiction genre tropes, which is sexual violence at such a young age ruins you forever in its own way. Either children become hypersexual as preteens into adulthood, or other ways of coping with it, substance abuse, insert said poisons. You know, like, usually sexual violence has a way of manifesting into terrible things in one's adult life. When we look at the children of It, who became the adults of It, I know that King doesn't spend too much time on this, but like the character of Beverly, she had some stuff with her father, she ended up marrying a guy exactly like her father, who was abusive and emotionally tumultuous and all that stuff. So, he kind of lets the thread follow down that childhood trauma realm. But I just don't feel that King did a strong enough job in connecting the trauma to present day Sam. Sam, at the very end, is kind of nonchalant about it. He's like, yeah, I hated it. Literally, that's a direct quote, what Sam says to this entity. I hated it. I feel that maybe King was burning out a little bit or running out of gas in terms of where he wanted the story to go, and he needed to build Sam's character more or connect this. I don't know, guys. It's just, I felt there's a really big pothole with what King is doing with this story, with focusing on the monster, destroying the monster, confronting the past, but the past never really affected Sam that much. Reading this story twice really showed me just how seemingly resilient Sam was. And that's the thing. I tried to give slack. I tried to give credit and assume maybe he just buried it so far deep down that it just was something he buried and it didn't affect his waking life at all. We kind of see this in Dr. Sleep a little bit. The character of Danny is all grown up. He's struggling with alcoholism and also struggling with the ghosts that continue to haunt him from the Overlook. And what he does is he mentally locks those ghosts up in a box in a cage inside his mind and they don't come out. He has the power to lock them up in there. So I kind of thought maybe Sam is doing something similar, but in Dr. Sleep, Danny's telling us he's locking them up, right? He's telling us that he's struggling with them and he's doing this mental exercise to get them out of his reality. We don't have any of that with Sam, guys. Sam is just, just fine. Like, this terrible thing happened to him. We never learn how it affected him, if it affected him. You know, the fact that he's single makes me so curious. Like, does he have a problem with sex or committing to an individual? Like, how... I, oh man, King stepped into a gold mine for character development and really walked away from it. It was quite sad because it's so huge. Ladies and gentlemen, this young boy is raped at the age of nine and that has a disastrous effect into teenage and adulthood. It can, it doesn't always have to happen. But if it doesn't always happen that way, then King, by all means, explain why Sam was so resilient. Because I am saying in the episode that he buried it deep down, but I don't know. 
King doesn't concretely say that. As the reader, we just have to assume he put it out of his mind. So I cannot be an apologist for the text and fix it in my own mind. I have to go with what King gives us, and he just doesn't give us anything. The third act of this novella is mostly Duncan, Naomi, Sam, and this guy named Stan we'll talk about in a couple minutes, just kind of getting together and figuring out that they got to defeat Ardelia on her home turf, and so it's kind of like this climactic conclusion to destroy the monster. But there's very little engagement with what coming to terms with the past means for the rest of Sam's life. And there's some beautiful exchanges with he and Naomi when he talks about one's debt being paid. It's so deep and King just doesn't go to the depths we need him to, at least for me. I think Sam Peebles could have been a hugely important character, guys. Somebody that we talk about on these Stephen King podcasts. Someone who just is larger than life, who really echoed so loudly in this novella. He he could have been absolutely incredible, but King does not give him the explanation needed. What happens to a life with such sexual trauma at a young age? How does it create a lasting impact? How does it torture someone from the inside out? Sam is, in many respects, someone who should have had a lot more problems than he does, and King just didn't go there at all at all. At all. I have a huge problem with that, guys. So, Sam Peebles is very, very problematic for me, and my criticism would be to really revise this character and add more present-day details that allow the reader to connect to that foreshadowing in a greater way and say, oh, this guy's not as okay as he seems on the surface. He is not okay. And I think this is just King getting lost in his own plot and the momentum of the story and the momentum of connecting the reader to this spooky library, this spooky monster woman, and the guy who rents the books is just an average Joe. But then at the end, King makes him victim of this terrible thing. And then I'm looking at all the pieces at the end of this story, having now read it twice, and I'm like, this doesn't work, Steve-O. No, Sam, goodness gracious, I mean, this horrible thing should have really made an impact on this guy. It could have been subtle, it could have been extreme, but you had to tell the reader something, something, Steve. We don't have anything. Huge criticism I have, guys. Sam Peebles, very flat and problematic. Next, my secondary criticism and or wishing well. Because Dave Duncan was such a glowing, vibrant character, we get so much time with Dave. He has these beautiful monologues, and we get these awesome flashbacks when he's with Ardelia and his descent into madness and alcoholism. Dude, let's chop Sam out of this and make Dave our main. Really, I mean, it could be done. Literally, any average Joe could walk into the library and rent some books. Like, it could be Dave. It really could be Dave. (laughs) Or make this entire thing set in the 50s, and then somebody like Sam comes in at the very end in the late 80s, and they have to help elderly Dave defeat Ardelia. That would have been awesome. I think we need some severe flip-floppage here. Sam needs to be taken out of our spotlight. Let's flip the timeline. Let's start in the 50s with Dave. Let's have Sam as a walk-on who is just as flat as needed because he's just a walk-on. Let's do that. Let's do that. We need some massive revision in order to make the dark heart of this story be the center of the story. And Dave brings that. Without Dave, oh my goodness, no, it would fall flat immediately because Sam isn't strong enough. He doesn't have the steel spine that we need. He doesn't have the weight that we need for a main character. (sighs) Yeah, I'm having a lot of trouble looking at Sam in any sort of positive way because Dave is who gets all my attention. Dave is the star of this show. He's the one who has the most skin in the game, maybe quite literally, with Ardelia, and he's the one who really needs to come to terms with his past and destroy it and come face to face with everything he was a part of. Genius! Genius development. Beautiful storytelling. Love everything about Dave Duncan. Let's chop Sam. And so, in addition to that, my next one is 
because Sam is just so floaty, he's very much like our character from <laughs> Elevation, just kind of floating away. He weighs nothing. I mean, the rape scene, it's incredible, really well done, terrifying, very strong in the text. But it's like, did we even need it? Did we even need it? You know, the library policeman, it is this manifestation of fear but we could have chopped it. I mean, I know that he really wanted to explore the library policeman, but like, we could have chopped it. We could have did something different because I I wonder, in regards to the use it or lose it, King brings us the rape scene, but he doesn't use it. He, He uses it to allow Sam to come to terms with what happened, like the actual plot, because for the longest time, Sam is super freaked out by the library policeman. We finally figure out what happened to him. It's terrible. But then nothing really comes of it, so to speak. Sort of, at the end, we get a little bit of resolution where it's interpreted that, okay, he faced the past. He faced the past, came to terms with it. But I don't know, guys. It's just the character of Sam just needed so much more for me. That, like, was the rape scene even utilized properly? Was it even needed? Because Sam is... How? Why is Sam our main character? I think this is what's been tripping me up the biggest, and it's so difficult because he's the guy who's guiding us into this story, right? He's the guy! It's him! We're following Sam, and oh, man, it's like... I don't want to follow you, Sam. I want to follow Dave. Dave Duncan is way cooler. I really like his character so much more. Why don't we spend some time with Dave? And I want to see Dave defeat Ardelia and more on their really effed up life together where there's just a lot of sexual madness, emptiness, alcoholism, preying upon children, excellent stuff. Sam needs a lot of work, guys. And so my criticism is like, was this rape scene even really needed? Because he doesn't really use it. Sam seems like a Teflon Don, like nothing, nothing really bothers him. Even the rape, when he comes to terms with it, he's like, oh yeah, that wasn't fun. That's kind of how it seems in those final moments with Sam. He's just like, I don't, I don't know. So I need to be careful because I'm assuming that all traumatic situations have to have a lingering impact. Maybe they don't. But if Sam is super resilient, if he really did bury it down deep, tell us, damn it. Come on, Steve. Like, explain this character to us. Explain why he is the way he is. Explain what this event did to him. We just don't have that. And so for a 200-page novella, yeah, that's not a lot of runway. You got to make some smart decisions. And he did not, in my opinion, with Sam. Sam needed to be much stronger, show some more meat in terms of what did this event do to you? How did it leave its impact? Because King doesn't go there at all. It's like he didn't really want the responsibility of dealing with it. I think he was also having way too much fun with Ardelia and Dave and, like, all that story that he just, yeah, Sam was kind of in the background. My last criticism, we, in the third act, I'm telling you guys, the third act is where all the problems, like, (laughs) King has a super strong first and second act, and then the last act is where the wheels kind of come off the bike a little bit. The spokes definitely (laughs) get a wrench thrown in them, and the, yeah, we just, I'll, I'll stop with the bike metaphors. Regardless, there's some guy named Stan Soames. Stan's a pilot, like a little puddle jumper, a little Cessna, and so all of a sudden, when they learn about the revelation of Ardelia, that she must be stopped, she must be destroyed, and that they gotta do it soon, we use the character of Stan, we hop into his plane. Stan is kinda connected by having a child who I believe was either killed or knew someone who was killed, so Stan is kind of connected to all this, but again, he's there for like five minutes, guys. I swear, this guy flies them to Des Moines for something. It's kind of unclear. They end up going to a gas station and getting something that they're going to need for the final confrontation with Ardelia. So, he just kind of flies them around, and yeah, not needed. I actually feel like the third act slash the flight to Des Moines, I don't, what was that, guys? I don't know what that was. 
if we're getting nitty gritty here, let's chop that. Let's chop that scene. Like, let's drive over to the library. I don't know why we exactly needed the flight to Des Moines. What happens is that the character of Sam undergoes sort of the final slice of awakening and realizing the memory he had been repressing, I think. Again, guys, it's so unclear and I've read it twice. It's just not connecting. This third act, the character of Stan Soames, it's like, buddy, no, who are you? I don't know who you are. You're just, just walk on that don't really, I, I just feel with a small novella, with as much momentum as we have at the end, it's just not working. And so I, let's chop Stan, let's chop the random flight to Des Moines. Let's just keep everything close to the chest. Let's keep it in house. The library, I believe, is driving distance from Angel Street and the recycling center. So yeah, I was kind of put off by the third act, guys. And even though I really enjoyed the story a lot more the second time, that third act is still very troublesome for me. It's like, oh my god, okay. This who's Stan? Why are why are we on a plane? What's happening? So it could have just been I was a little bit more intolerant or bratty because I'm reacting to the fact that I can't believe this entire novella is centered around Sam. Sam is an underdeveloped character. I was just frustrated by the fact that Sam's our guide into this story is all we have. And yeah, those are my my criticisms, guys. I could go on and on. I don't want to because it's just going to beat a dead horse. But let's recap. Criticism number one, let's, let's fix Sam. Sam's a little bit flat and underbaked. I have some issues with that. Next, why don't we chop Sam out and put Dave in? Dave was tremendous. Why don't we flip around the timeline? Let's do some massive revision. Number three, who is Stan Soames and why? Number four, the third act in general. How about we give some attention there, folks? But overall, friends, this is such a perplexing work. It is dark. We've got dark fantasy. We have human horror. We have some beautiful characterization with Dave Duncan. Ardelia Lortz is a really cool villain, guys. I really want to spend some time examining her character a little bit more for my Women of Stephen King panel slash dissertation I'm chipping away at. Good things there. This was definitely worth reading. Very strange, very strong. Tapping into the Pennywise playbook, I think. If you are a fan of it, if you are a fan of The Outsider, definitely read this one. And of course, The Manhattan Club, The Man Who Would Not Shake Hands, as well as The Breathing Method. Read those two novellas and then jump over here really quick. Let's connect some dots and take some notes. Oh my goodness, guys. So, I do have a lot of problems about the library policeman, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, I could be overthinking it. So check on me in about a week or two. Let's let this one simmer. Let's move on to The Sun Dog, our last novella in Four Past Midnight. Let's move on, and then at the end of Sun Dog, we'll kind of take a look at all four of them, and maybe I'll feel a little bit kinder toward the library policeman. Maybe I'll just stop thinking about it as much, overanalyzing. That's a thing. That's a real life thing. We're, we're going to let this simmer. We're going to turn the heat off. Let's just step away and, and maybe I'll give it a little bit more grace on this final examination. But thank you guys for listening. I appreciate you all so much. I know this was a weird one. Weird times. We're building ourselves back after computer disaster, but I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you will reach out with your thoughts on the library placement. You can hit me up on any of the socials as well as underrated sk at gmail. I would love to hear your thoughts on the story, on what you think about Four Past Midnight and our coverage thus far. If you haven't shared the show with a friend, please do so. We would greatly appreciate that. That would be beautiful. And write and review and subscribe and all the things. I will be back soon with the Sun Dog and maybe another constant reader interview with someone amazing, someone that is just fantastic. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. Take care and bye-bye.